When we were young, we read more often because we had to. It was the only way for us to get knowledge and to be enlightened. Read to your heart's delight and be enlightened. Let's just read. It's a podcast by Andy's Personal Development. Stay tuned for more reading and enlightenment. Our next guest on Let's Just Read is Nicole Kerr. She is an award-winning health expert, disabled Air Force veteran, and NDE survivor. She's also the co-author of Eating the Rainbow, Lifelong Nutritional Wellness Without Lies, Hype, or Calculus. This is our guest. Her current publication is entitled, You Are Deathless, A Near-Death Experience Taught Me How to Fully Live and Not fear debt. So, let's welcome this inspired survivor, live on Let's Just Read, Nicole Kerr. And she's an award-winning health expert and is the co-author of Eating the Rainbow, Lifelong Nutritional Wellness Without Lies, uh, hype or calculus and right now what we're really going to do is we are going to look at a publication that is called you are deathless for the purpose of this episode so how are you doing nicole welcome to the show oh thank you so much andy i am actually delighted to be on this show with you and i so appreciate the opportunity to to meet you and talk to you uh, your audience about my book, um, You Are Deathless. It just came out in October, yeah, I guess it was August, and it's already a number one bestseller in the near-death experience category. So I feel so honored because it's an important message that I was given by spirit to get out about not fearing death. So I'm excited to talk to you today about it. Well, we are delighted to have you, and we are saying congratulations on achieving that best selling status and we hope that you continue to have much success and it's an impactful information and enlightenment that you would give to others as they read your publication but before we get into the the tenets of the publication tell me about that time before you were 19 years of age when you became a cadet at the u.s uh, air force academy Bring us up to scratch, up to speed with the period of your life just before that. What were you doing? What were you involved in at that time? Nothing related to the military. I only went to the United States uh, Air Force Academy in order to please my father. Okay. I did nothing growing up that I wasn't interested in airplanes, none of that kind of stuff. I modeled, I was on a teen board, I read on the school newspaper, I was in junior achievement, I was in a, a ballet, I did a lot of piano, a lot of activities, but not one of them related to the, the military. And then my dad, who had graduated from the uh, Air, Air Force Academy, wanted one of us four siblings to go and I have two brothers and they are younger than me but they didn't have the grades or uh the, the, the insight to really want to go so I was going to be daddy's girl and please him and so I applied and oh my gosh I got in I couldn't believe it. I thought for sure it's a rigorous process to get accepted at any of the, the military academies in the United yeah. States, as, as you well know. And so uh, women were only recently admitted and the first class graduated in 1980. So my class was 86. So I was one of the first classes and uh, I got accepted 
And I remember the principal in my high school telling me to uh, all over the intercon system, Nicole, come to my office. And I was like, uh oh. And it was the representative <laughs> in Washington saying, congratulations, you're off to the United States Air Force Academy. And I was like, oh, crap, now I got to go. Um, and so I went and I knew within the first three weeks uh, that my soul was in the wrong place. Okay. I, you know, I appreciate what our military does to defend and protect, but our souls are not designed to kill one another. Yeah. And so to be training in ways to hurt and kill other people was just, I, I was just really um, in the wrong place. And I couldn't quit because my dad had instilled a sense of curse. That's my last name. We don't quit. We don't yeah. get to we don't get depressed and we don't quit things, you know, and especially something that is that uh, uh, commendable to get, you know, a spot in one of yeah. the academies. Yeah. So I was busy being a people pleaser and it cost me a lot my life. So yeah. I would recommend to people not to please your parents <laughs> all the time. I know why you're little, you have to, to survive, but I never did get to individuate and become my own person and be able to stand up for my own self. Instead, I was so determined to find a way to get him to accept me, love me, uh, praise me, appreciate me, and most of all, love me. And I thought if I did that, he would. And then my sophomore, I, I kept going, even though it was abusive, yeah. uh, especially your first year at any of these institutions, you get physically abused, mentally, emotionally, and there is such a thing as spiritual abuse. And I will bring that up a little bit later, but wow. that happened as well. And so um, I just put my head down and I just went forward, even though I felt like I was a loser, even within my squadron. You know, I was always the last one in from a run. I, but I made it through by the grace of God. I don't know how. I just kept pushing through. And then my sophomore year, when I knew I should have quit after my freshman year and just said, this is it. It's not for me. I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. So I showed up the, the sophomore year and that's when the crash happened at the beginning yeah. of my sophomore year. Okay, so you spent how many years before the crash happened? I was 19. So I just gotten out of uh, high school and one year in, in the academy. So that counts as one year in college. So how did the crash happen? What was that experience like for you, Nicole? Well, here's the crash. If yeah. your audience can see it. Uh, yeah, we can see it. We can see it. Uh, it was a squadron event, and I was getting a ride back with another cadet because you're not allowed to have cars out there to your juniors yeah. and seniors. Yeah. So I, I said, you know, can I have a ride back? I thought, okay, he's just, we were the last ones to leave. Uh, they had been drinking. They'd had alcohol available, which is against the Air Force regulations. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, I grew up in a uh, non-alcoholic family. So he wanted to, he said, sure. He had a Corvette convertible. Uh -huh. He said, hop in the car with me and off to a bar we're going to go. And I'm like, a bar, we got to get back. We have to be back by 7.35 or we're going to get in trouble. And he's like, nah, we'll be okay. Went and had two beers and a cigarette. Oh boy, am I? And then we got in the car and he wanted to go watch the sunset. And I'm like, we are really going to be late. And I didn't realize this is how naive I was. I had never been on a date before. My dad found no value in dating. So none of us dated in yeah. high school or junior high. Yeah. So now I go to school with almost 4,000 guys. And my dad's rules are no smoking, no drinking, no dating upperclassmen. Okay. Now here I am in college and this is supposed to be fun, right? And so I'm like, okay, I'll go along with this. But when he tried a sexual advance, I got really scared and I said, no, and let's go. So we got back on the road and he tried it again. And next thing I know, I wound up in the ICU in Penrose Community Hospital. And the only thing that I remembered from that point when we got back on, on the road again and waking up in the ICU was bright white light, 
clear light. And the surgeon, I said to her, you know, could that be the operating room lights? And she said, no, you were, you were unconscious. And the way I piece the story together is from the EMT that actually he's one of my angels. He came to my hospital 10 weeks after the car crash to talk to me, uh, uh, medical records, the district attorney's report and the nurse and the surgeon. So I gathered all that information to put that piece together. And then mm, almost 20 years later, boom, my memory comes back. Wow. Out of the clear blue, I'm going to work at the Centers for Disease Control. I was living in Atlanta, went to, Star went to Starbucks, got my usual drink there, and then clears the bell, Andy. I could see the way I was sitting in the passenger seat in the Corvette with one leg up on the dashboard, the other one crossed over. Please don't ever sit that way. That is the worst way to sit in the car is your legs up on the dashboard or your legs out, you know, on the, the window. Um, and so I saw that positioning and saw what was happening. And I said, uh oh, I better not go to work. I'm going to go to my chiropractor body worker. So yeah. I went to his office and stayed there all day till he could see me. And he said, Nicole, these are repressed memories mm -hmm. and they're starting to come up now. And this is trauma. And so the, you're, you're ready for it. Your body feels safe enough finally to let this up and you have some support to yeah. deal with it. So yeah. then that part of the story came up, but for those 20 years, all I remembered was bright white lights. And I pieced it together, like I said, from those other parts. And I was pronounced dead at the scene. Uh, some bystanders had heard it, went out, called 911. They mm -hmm. checked me, could not get any vitals, covered me up with a blanket. And then when the first responders got there, it was between 10 and 13 minutes that I was clinically dead. Wow. And when he took the blanket off me, the EMT, uh, he said that he could not get any vitals. And so the only thing left for him to do was what they call a sternal knuckle press, mm -hmm. where they, they do that to elicit pain in the body. And my right pupil, my eye flinched and uh, the pupil dilated. So that's all he got. And so, then, and then it was like, okay, she's alive. And now his issue was, can I keep her alive? Yeah. So what happened was he was able to get a blood pressure 60 over zero at that point before he wow. couldn't get anything. Now that's basically dead because yeah. our regular yeah. Yeah. blood pressure is supposed to, re supposed to be about 120 over 80. Yes. Yes. Um, so, uh, Lots of injuries. I'm not going to name them all because they're in the book, but just let's just say uh, it was enough to kill me. And uh, I will also say at that point when my eye flinched is when my soul came back into my body. So we say that saying the eyes are the window to the soul. Yeah. Okay. My soul had flown out of my body when I went through the windshield and I was going up yeah. and my energy body split, my soul flew up and an angel, and in the book I call him Casper the ghost, yeah. uh, but it was male. And then after the book uh, was released, my grandfather came to me in a meditation and told me it was him that came down and saved me. And oh. He was 58 years old when he passed away and I was 58 years old. It, it, he passed away that month around that time frame. And he. Me and I was 58 years old now that he's telling me this, you know, so um, I had all the pieces right. I knew it was male energy. I knew it was this, that, and the other, but I just never knew it was my grandfather. And he wasn't 58. He was in his thirties. So I could see him. And so he's the one that took me up to the other side and the space where I heard other angels or beings, they're angels, uh, beings talking. Now it wasn't English. Mm -hmm. I wasn't in my body. I could look down and see my body physical body in the ditch. Okay. I could see the clothes I was wearing, the khaki shorts, you know, I, and I, I, I could see that I was dead. And I knew that when my uh, 
soul flew out, I knew that when I had hit the earth, I was going to die. And I cried out, God help me, you know, and, uh, but it was, I, I knew it was just going to be too late. So these conversations that were going on, one of them had a direct message that you have to ask your angels for help because we have free will. They are not going to interfere in our lives unless we ask for help. So unless it's an emergency like me, where it's life or death. So we need to develop a relationship with the spiritual realm. We all have at least one guardian angel. Okay. And we can call on these angels. There's, they come in many forms to help us with whatever it is. We don't have to wait for a crisis for that to happen and realize they're there to help us. We are not alone. We are never alone. We have this amazing uh, spiritual realm of beings that are ready to assist us in whatever we need. So that's the first lesson. And then my grandfather told me that uh, I was going to go back in that body. And I was like, oh, no, please, please, no. Because I knew, Andy, getting back in this physical body, I was mangled. I mean, my foot was amputated. My pelvis was shattered. I had road burn. I mean, slicing layers of skin off my face. It was bad. And yeah. I knew I was going to have physical difficulty handicap wise the rest of my life okay those are things you just don't get over uh, thank god i didn't have a uh, spinal injury and i can walk but i had to learn to walk again you know it was like being an infant I, and so i didn't know what my life was going to look like from a physical standpoint what i would be able to do and not do so the limitations then i knew i disappointed my father especially and my mother agrees with everything my father says so I disappointed her and because God is my dad and I image I grew up Southern Baptist and Lutheran uh God was of course disappointed in me because I disappointed my parents and so why do I want to come back to family disappointed and that I feel doesn't love me and that blames me? And they actually, my dad said that you uh, made a bad decision. You're to blame for this. It didn't matter that I wasn't driving. Yeah. And the third thing was I had lost faith in that God of concept of God that I had grown up with, where God was loving and uh, protective and your friend. And then on the other side, uh, God was judgmental, critical, and the wrath of God would come on you if you disobeyed any of these rules. And every congregation had different rules. And so God must have been confused at what all these rules were, you know. But I knew when I died at 19, I feared death because I disobeyed my dad. And so I came back and the message on the other side was to tell people not to be afraid of death. Okay. That's amazing. Absolutely amazing, Nicole. I want you to tell us a bit about neuroemotional technique and okay. how that was helpful to you in your recovery and even ongoing uh, therapy. Tell us a bit about that. Okay. NET, uh, we are very uh, ignorant in America with our emotions. Most of us only get told uh, you can be bad, mad, sad, and glad. That's it, you know? But growing up, we were taught you don't hurt your mother. You don't get angry at your parents. You know, you don't allow certain emotions to uh, be experienced through your body. You stuff them down, right? So that you're a good kid. And so... What I realized is I was a dietitian at the time because I went to school. I developed an eating disorder as a result of not getting mental health help from the crash. Yeah. My parents told the doctor when he said Nicole needs psychiatric help, they said, no, she, uh, our help comes from God and Jesus. She's going to be fine. Okay. Well, well, let me tell you, Jesus and God never came and sat on the sofa and had a conversation. 
information about my trauma and my mental health and how to get better. So my body had to figure out a way to deal with it. And I wound up with an eating disorder and it lasted almost 20 years. And I hated myself. Eating disorders are very secretive. They're uh, very painful. Uh, there's different scales of it, but it's a way to just push all those feelings down and not let them come up because they're just too hard to, to, to feel. Yeah. So I went into nutrition thinking I was going to fix myself. Okay. <laughs> and guess what? I learned a hell of a lot about nutrition, but I didn't fix myself. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went into helping eating disorders, you know, uh, so, you know, it's ironic, we go into things that we think we can help our own self with, you know, and then realize, no, this is a bigger picture here. This is how my body dealt with the trauma. Um, let's see, what did you ask me before? I got off track there. <laughs> I asked you how um, NET NET, that's right. Okay, so neuro, yeah, neuro New emotional technique. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I learned about that about eight years ago because I would I would give people diets. I was a wellness director at a hospital and all kinds of things, and I would tell people. And most people know what to eat. They know they don't need to live off fast food and cut out the you know pint of Ben and Jerry's every night or whatever. But um, I noticed that people would get stressed, and when they got stressed. They completely forgot what their diet was supposed to look like. And it didn't matter if they had kidney disease or diabetes, which really is important that you follow your diets on that because yeah. you could kill yourself if you don't have your glucose or anyway. So um, I started thinking, oh my gosh, this is an unconscious issue and people are reacting to the stressor and part of our brain here up front is called the prefrontal cortex that process all the intellectual executive decision making so this part of the brain knows what you need to eat in order to stay healthy but then you get stressed on that part of the brain in the back those two little almond shaped uh, the amygdala where that fight flight freeze uh, yeah. yeah that's where that hangs out it hijacks this, it goes, shoop. and so you're in fear, massive fear, and all you want to do is calm that down, so the dopamine from comfort foods is, so you got to start understanding what is the trigger, and all of us have emotions that we have not processed, and we will come up against present day situations that mimic it, and we'll go back to that age where we did not process it appropriately, and we will act it out from that age instead of catching up to present day and realize, oh, wait a minute, that's going to sabotage me if I don't do, you know, uh, if I don't deal with it. So NET is non-invasive. It uses acupressure points kinesiology with muscle testing and psychology. And it has been a game changer in my life so much so that I went and got certified in it. And uh, that was all I did for a while was uh, with food in particular is helping people understand why they were going to the Ben and Jerry's when they knew better and to get at that root issue instead of just dealing with symptoms and telling people you need to exercise for 30 minutes or blah, 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 blah. We all know that. And the, the, the so that's what um, I've done. And it's a fabulous technique. And there's a great documentary on uh, YouTube called Stressed. And mm -hmm. if you want to learn more about it, you can, um, can watch the doc documentary, but it really tells you what's going on with the brain. And it's not something you're doing consciously, because if we could figure this out, we wouldn't eat that pint, yeah. you know, so we're only acting with about five to one to 5% consciousness. The rest of this has been programmed early in our lives. Yep, that's correct. That's so very, very true. And many of us are not aware of that. We are not. In no, no. Patient. We just don't know it. Yeah. So Nicole, tell us, what made you come to the decision that you needed to write this book? When my memory came back and I was told that I need to, to help people not to be afraid of 
uh, death, I thought, how in the world? That's a big message. I yeah. said, how in the world am I going to do that? Yeah. And uh, it took me 13 years to write this book of 178 pages. Okay. Wow. And long day. Okay. So that's like me birthing a baby. It's just like, it just took a long time. Okay. So this is my, this is my baby. I don't have babies, but this well, doggies, but not baby babies, okay. human, human babies. Yeah. Um, so I actually healed a lot of my wounds by writing this book okay, I, because I, I put pen to paper and I put my emotions down and I was working with NET at the time for that as well. And it really helped me because I grew up disconnected from my body. I could think my way through things. I could say, okay, I am mad at Andy because Andy didn't let me do so-and-so, but I didn't embody it. I okay. just cut it off and thought about it in the mind and that doesn't work right. because the Chinese figured this out 5,000 years ago is each organ represents a different emotion. So your liver is about anger. And if you're not processing anger, your liver is going to start giving you problems. Mm -hmm. And when the doctors cannot find a reason for something going on that you, that you have, it's either the environment causing it, it's your lifestyle or it's a spiritual or emotional issue. Right. Yeah, that's a fact. I know that. So why the name, why the, 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 the term, you are deathless? Oh, that's a term most people don't like to hear is death. Okay, we are a society that most, <laughs> no, it's like almost every book written, death itself is cloaked in this uh, veil of doom and gloom. And I mean, even think about Halloween, you know, it's just doom and gloom about death and it has this cloud of depression around us and negativity. And I wanted to use that word because I'm trying to change the narrative in our culture and country that that's not true. My oh. own experience, along with hundreds of thousands of other people, is 100% different that have experienced near-death experiences. Yeah. And death is absolute beauty. It's light and this loving kindness on the other side because God is love. There's no negativity, no judgmentalism, no wrath of God coming on you. Those were all man-made concepts designed to instill fear in us so that we could stay controlled by a religion or whatever yeah. the situation mm. is because fear is not of god fear yeah. fear fear is a low vibration and when you are making decisions out of fear it's coming out of that part of your brain yeah. that is in that fight flight freeze and you're not going to make in my opinion, the highest and best decision for you, your family, or whatever the situation, you're making it out of fear, which is um, you're not in clarity. Wow. That's that's an amazing, amazing <laughs> foresight there, Nicole. Um, I, I'm a bit taken aback by the spiritual aspect of it as well, um, opposed as opposed to religion and religiosity that have entrapped people and, and kept them in, in that sort of um, fear on one side and then faith maybe on the other side, but they're not too sure. But you have been there. You have had that experience. You walked yes. into the other yes. side and you had the opportunity to come back. What is the main message that you want people to get from your experience through the publication? What do you want them to be enlightened about? so that there's no confusion. I want them to understand that they need to really define their concept of God source, whatever you think is out there that is bigger than them and have an understanding that that energy, that love, that presence wants the highest and greatest good for you, period. And free will gets in there and distorts it all, okay? And man gets in there and tries to have greed and power and all these things. But that's not God. God is this 
this there's nowhere God is not. Mm -hmm. I love that because God is within me. It's not external. And all my life I was told God was external. And when I, those lights that the, the beauty that I experienced on the other side, that's your soul, your perfect soul. There's nothing wrong with you. And we're told here, oh, this is wrong with you. This is wrong with you. And we're judged. And there's no judgment on the other side. You know, you're not going to be separated from your family. So you don't have to fear these these messages and these false belief systems that you were told that you're going to go to hell and be separated because, you know, you used a cuss word or something, you know, and it's little little kids, six years old, going to Sunday school and learning this, it is terrifying. So you grow up in this fear of, you know, you're not good enough. Um, and that's not true at all. So the message go on. You have, I don't know how many years on this planet in this lifetime, because we, any of us could die tomorrow. Yep. You know, it's not a guarantee that we are going to live to 80. But we need to prepare ourselves and start understanding what death is for us and where we're going and be in alignment with it so that you truly do understand and become the person that you were meant to be when you were born on this planet. Yeah. How's, how's that? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's really awesome. Really, really awesome. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm. I'm looking at um, a video here and I just want to play it. Oh, let me see if I could get it up and running. And if I do, you're going to just um, tell me about it after. Okay, great. So, <laughs> um, whoa, look at you, look at you. <laughs> cool, you know, I haven't, seen it. I haven't seen it in a while, but it's a powerful message. It is. It is extremely powerful. And Nicole, it's your message. That is what makes the yes. difference. Yeah. You are not trying to recite something that somebody else experienced. You're not telling a story. It is your account and it is real to you. How much difference have you felt uh, with regards to your being able to truly accept yourself, live your life to the fullest, and have that spiritual connection with God now, one that you can only describe for yourself? How powerful is it for you? Well, I'm getting chicken skin as you're saying that, but I'm free. Okay. That's what I am. I'm free of all those false beliefs that I grew up with. Uh, my parents still believe the Bible literally, and uh, they don't believe my experience uh, could happen. And so, unfortunately, I didn't write. I, I don't speak to my parents now because they have absolutely the religious religious addicts. And when you're dealing with people like that, you can't win. Uh, their God is is they will come back with a scripture and. You know, and I, I said, but Jesus said, judge not lest you be judged. You know, I, I just, it doesn't matter. They have to be right. So 
I have learned so much about myself and the belief systems that I have carried forward generationally that nobody questioned. And I have stopped that because now is a time to awaken to who you are, not who somebody tells you who you should be or are. Nobody defines that for you except yourself. And I think love is the most important reason we're here and that ability to expand it. And I didn't love myself. Mm. I was trying to love my father and get him to forgive me. Then I could love myself. And I realized he's never going to do that. And so loving myself, it doesn't mean going to get manicures and all that kind of stuff. That's being nice to yourself. But true love is accepting that whatever you've got going on in this physical body, you love it. You love every scar. You love every experience. You love, you know, you truly see your essence of love and beauty and light. And it doesn't matter what else anyone says, you know that truth. And I think that's where the power comes from is that alignment with your body, mind, spirit, And you realize that you are one. We are all one huge consciousness. Everyone and everything is connected. Love is an energy and energy speak to one another. And when we leave, the breath is energy, you know? So that's what I've learned. And I keep learning. I don't think I, you know, if anybody tells you they know the answer, that's a red flag. You run from that because this is something experiential that you have to figure out and you have to be in alignment with. And it's a journey all of us are here to take and to learn to love ourselves and not criticize. Quit judging your thoughts, your emotions, your actions, and love yourself. We're all doing the best that we can. Amazing. <laughs> It's just like you just preach a message, Jen. <laughs> I can say an amen to that. So we are, we are so glad that you came in to share your experience. It's, it's an amazing experience, something that I've been looking at, thinking about for a little while. And you have given me some level of understanding from your personal experience. Uh, the difference also that it has made in your life, and you speak powerfully about love, an alignment and something that we need to understand that makes a big difference and self-acceptance just as we are. And it starts with us. We love ourselves just as yes. God has created us. Yes. We're able to love others and appreciate others as well because he's, he has created everyone. So there's no love lost. Yes. So let me just see if I have any comments or questions. And on the live chat... Okay, so not at this time. So what I'd like to do, uh, Nicole, is give you the opportunity to tell them how they can get your book or if they need to make contact with you personally, um, how they can make contact with you, where the book is on sale, um, your social hashtag handles. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I have a website, uh, www.nicole, N-I-C-O-L-E, K-E-R-R dot com. And if I just released my book in audio, uh, an audio book. So it's available on Audible. It's seven hours and six minutes. And I narrate it myself. And boy, did that bring up some triggers too to narrate your own life story and then have to listen to you tell your own story in your own voice. That was pretty powerful, but it uh, that's now available. And then the images that are in the book that have the pictures that are in the book are on my website. If you go to you are deathless and click on book images, you'll see the car crash. You'll see me in the hospital. You'll see my life evolving. So that is there. I will join book clubs. If you use my book for a book club meeting, I guarantee you it will be the most intimate revealing meeting that your book club has ever had if you all start talking about what your view on death is you will get to know each other on a on a truly sacred intimate level and discuss this because we need to bring it out in the open and start where it's going to happen to everybody and um i am also on linkedin under what am i under uh yeah you'll just find me under linkedin and then instagram nicole.angelique 
dot Kurt and Facebook, uh, facebook.com slash Nicole dot A dot Kerr. So those are the only platforms I can handle, Andy. There's just, I'm a one, I'm a one person show, you know, so it's like okay. just getting it out there. And, you know, I am available to do public speaking. This is my vocation now. I've quit other occupations um, and I'm doing this full time and I love it. And it also allows me to be able to continue working on myself and deal with my issues. But I'm so grateful the book is out and it's just being received so well. And it's time for people to start taking responsibility for their own spirituality and not putting it off on their parents or their grandparents or whatever. Wonderful. What I'm acting with because when I would pray, I called it God was, yeah, God was a vending machine and he's not, it's not. I had the wrong concept. So now that I've, I'm learning it, it's just so freeing. It really is. And I'm not scared anymore. Okay, great. Wonderful. So we have had Nicole Kerr. Um, she has had an amazing near death experience and her book entitled you are deathless is available on her website she's on linkedin and amazon so check her out and you can make contact with her with regards to public speaking or book clubbing as the case might be yeah it's always going to be available to help so until next time this is andy of andy's personal development on let's just read scene Continue to read so that you can get enlightenment, knowledge, and information. And we thank Nicole for being here, sharing her personal experience, and giving us some vital information and enlightenment on her near-death experience. We hope that she continues to have much success going forward, and that You Are Deathless will continue to bring that message of hope to many who would read it in the future. Okay, so until then, I am saying Godspeed. Shalom. Namaste. Namaste. Hold on, Nicole.